Hi, everybody, and welcome to our um, Teaching About Elections webinar. Thank you for coming today. Today we're going to do, um, we're going to go over the agenda really quickly, and then we're going to do a walk through our materials for teaching about elections. So we're going to talk about some deliberations that we have that, um, that touch on elections, um, some case study methods and some specific case summaries that might be used, um, a gerrymandering lesson, and, um, and then we're going to give you an overview of the resources that we've collected for at-home learning since most people are in that situation now and maybe in the fall as well. Um, we're going to do our best to keep time for Q&A, and in a moment I'll be telling you about how you can use the different functions of Zoom to register your questions. And then um, we'll finish up with a little bit about how to keep in touch with us and hopefully stay in our network so we can um, be there to support you. So our outcomes for today are pretty simple. We just want to start, share some resources that we have about teaching for elections. We know that the 2020 elections will be a huge topic in every classroom. Um, some people might start that this at the end of this year to pave the way for next year or start with it in the fall. Um, we're gonna focus in on three of our methods, um, the deliberations, case study methods, and lessons. Um, throughout these, we're not gonna specifically focus on at-home learning, but we might touch on it, and then we will, at the end, tell you where to find more resources that are specifically on that topic. So we are the Teacher Professional Development and um, Program and Curriculum team at Street Law, and I am Kathy Ruffing, um, and I'm gonna let Jen Wheeler introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jen Wheeler. Those are emails. Um, in a second, I'm going to give you a QR code that's going to link you to all the materials, including our emails um, and that Street Law website that you saw. So there's a couple ways that you can access these links. One is to use the camera function on your phone. You don't even use a QR. You don't even need a QR reader, just your camera, and it will bring you to a link to all of these materials, or you can use that bit.ly link right there. And um, we also have with us today, Ben, who is our communications coordinator, and uh, Lillian, who is our law school intern, who are gonna help with things like putting some links in the chat so that maybe if you wanna access them right away, um, it's a little faster uh, while, we, while we work through the webinar today. So we're interested in who is here today. You took a poll as you came in today and Ben Marks is gonna reveal the answer to those polls. Well, we'd also like to talk to you, or we also like to have you introduce yourself in the chat feature. So if you, um, if you wanna say hi in the chat, tell us a little bit about who you are um, and where you teach, that would be fantastic. Um, make sure when you want, when you're communicating, if you want everyone to see it, the panelists and the participants, that you select that where it says to. So you have the option to say all panelists or um, all panelists and attendees. So feel free to um, introduce yourself in the chat. And you can see here that we are largely government and law teachers. Um, we have a middle school teacher. That's fantastic. So please. Um, Feel free to introduce yourself. I'm gonna just talk about some other methods to participate in the webinar while you're doing that. So um, we have the Q&A function. So that will allow you to leave questions about methods. This is really what we would prefer that you use. Um, and when you leave um, questions, before you leave a question, skim through the questions that have already been submitted and if one is really similar to yours or you can add on to that question please do that and then upvote the question so there is a function that allows you to say yeah i have that question too and when we do q a we'll start with the question uh, with the questions that have the most upvotes so please take a second and look at other people's questions as well um, I can see that you all already are comfortable with the chat function because we're getting introductions um, from all over the place. Thank you for doing that. 
Um, and again, if you just want to reach us, if there's a technical issue um, and you're just trying to reach one of us for a link or um, a technical issue, you can just send a panelist. If you want everyone to see it, if you want to suggest an extension to an activity or tell us about something that's worked really well in your classroom, you can select panelists and participants. Um, there's also a function to raise your hand if you want to ask a verbal question and those um, would be questions that you want to ask sort of with an immediate, you need an immediate answer to your question. So before we go on to deliberations, we do have another poll. We'd like to see um, what kind of street law resources that you have been using. So Ben, can you put that poll up, please? And then I'm gonna pass it over to um, Jen, who is our expert at deliberations, who will walk us through how to use deliberations when teaching about elections. So if you don't mind taking the poll, we'd love to see um, if you've used our deliberations, our case study methods, case summaries for Supreme Court cases, lessons, SCOTUS in the classroom, or if you've never used them before. And this will just kind of let us know what we maybe need to spend a little bit more time on. Hi everyone, uh, it's Jen Wheeler I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, street laws deliberation resources and uh, how they connect to um, Ben is sharing the poll results. Great. So we've got some folks who use deliberations already. Maybe after this we'll have a uh, tick up a few more people who use deliberations and got a lot of folks who uh, are familiar with what Kathy will present about later case, using case summaries for Supreme Court cases. And we're glad to see some folks on, on the webinar who have never used street law materials before. We hope that um, this gives you uh, some resources that you feel like you could use in your classrooms. So uh, as far as our deliberation materials go, um, before we kind of get into the topics, the content that we uh, cover in deliberations, I wanted to share, um, as, as I read in, in the poll, only six of us have actually used deliberations in the classroom, so I wanted to share what a deliberation is. Um, what it looks like. So it, as you can see, it's based on, um, if you're familiar with the structured academic controversy model of discussion, uh, that's what this is based on. It is a model for bringing classroom discussion um, kind of to life. And it's different from a debate, but still allows for the discussion of uh, current controversial issues. While we think that this uh, method is best done in person, um, we did do a whole webinar, an hour long webinar on uh, how this strategy could be adapted to online learning. And so I'll share with you, um, or we'll share with you uh, some of the resources connected to that um, before the end of this webinar. They're in the link that was provided at the very beginning. But so basically a, a deliberation uh, starts with an introduction. What is a deliberation? Um, why you would want to do a deliberation, what rules you'd want to follow for talking about current contested issues. And then next, uh, with a street law deliberation, we ask that teachers use um, a common reading, which is a little bit different from kind of traditional structured academic controversy, where we've written the reading. Um, we have tried our very best to make sure that we are um, using open controversial issues as the topic that we have uh, adequately uh, presented reasonable arguments on either side of the issue, that we've selected issues that are important to young people um, and are important to what's happening now. Um, after students do the reading, there's kind of that check-in clarification of the reading and the topic, but then steps four, five, and six are a part of uh, small group conversation about the reading and about the topic. And so step four asks that students in small teams prepare uh, and present about one side of the issue um, and, and uh, a small team would do the same. Um, and then they would reverse positions um, so that, you know, you might start on the yes side of an issue and then you move to the no side of an issue and, and you take that side 
Um, so that's one great thing about de uh, deliberation compared to debate is that you're not stuck with one side the whole time. Um, and then step six is uh, a small group free discussion where you kind of talk about the issues um, together uh, with the goal of seeing if you could reach consensus. You might not actually reach consensus. Um, and then step seven and eight, you come back together as a whole group to have conversation about it. Um, so deliberations are uh, just as kind of a summary of what, what we want to um, focus on with the deliberation. Kathy, if you can click once. Um, they are multi-sided, they're cooperative, and they're consensus driven. So that's kind of the kind of big goal of when, when you do a deliberation, this is what you want students to get out of it. So the next slide talks about uh, the materials that we have in a deliberation topic pack. We've lo got lots of different topics, but I wanted to share with you for each topic, we've got these six uh, materials that go with each. So a lesson guide that kind of walks you through how to do a deliberation, um, a reading, so like the reading that I just talked about, a reading on the controversial issue, it's been vetted, it's, um, it's got arguments for either side. We've got a glossary that goes with the reading, quotes that are not in the reading but that offer a kind of valuable addition and extension to the reading, a visual, and then suggested resources that can uh, support the reading either through building student background knowledge or through uh, extension beyond the deliberation. And there are eight different uh, deliberation topics that we currently have available in our, um, in our free store right now. So obviously the very first one, the compulsory voting one is most related to our current topic on teaching about elections. The question for that deliberation is should voting be compulsory? And that uh, topic allows students to talk about voting, voter turnout, what voting is like and how it might improve in the United States. And it also brings in a kind of global education um, uh, context to it because we have to talk, if we're going to talk about compulsory voting, we have to talk about where they do compulsory voting in places like Australia, for example and how it works there um, in order for students to weigh whether it might work here. Um, so that's probably the best example of our existing deliberation materials for whether uh, that fit into talking about elections. But as you know, in talking about elections, lots of contested public policy issues come up during elections um, as, as candidates talk about their platforms. And so you may find that some of these other topics uh, insert nicely into um, talking about elections, you know, if, if juvenile justice issues uh, come up with a, a candidate in a debate, for example, to be able to pivot to using that deliberation to have a deeper conversation about that uh, contested issue. So on the next slide, we've got uh, the example of the visual from our compulsory voting reading, just to give you an idea of what some of the resources in, uh, in these topic sets look like. Um, I figured this would be a lot more interesting than showing you a screenshot of the reading. Um, so this visual uh, just shows a, a political cartoon that's, uh, as you can see, that we've got a, a likeness of President Obama talking about mandatory voting. So it allows students to kind of examine a political cartoon and examine this topic through the lens of, uh, of the cartoon. I can see that um, someone asked, do you have anything on mail-in voting? Mail-in voting is mentioned in the compulsory voting deliberation as are um, like same day registration and other tactics to increase voter turnout. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do in our deliberations is, although the question asks a very black and white um, or like drives toward a very black and white response, so the question uh, it, for this one is should voting be compulsory? And you'd think, you know, the answer is yes or no, but throughout all of our deliberations, we try to bring up some kind of middle ground options for discussion. And so mail-in voting is, is uh, a part of that um, just because we want students to be able to talk about the kind of areas of common ground and consensus that might happen in that conversation. So this is one example of uh, something that might that, that you would see if you wanted to do um, the, the deliberation on compulsory voting. 
We also have, um, or sorry, to get access to these materials, you'll see that they're in our uh, street law store. And so this slide is just a little glimpse into what it would be like if you tried to get these materials on our street law store. You see that the, the term store is in quotation marks. Um, all of the materials we're talking about today and almost all of the materials on the store are completely free. Um, and we usually, we incorporate the slide into our, our webinars because sometimes folks think that they're about to have to pay for something and they get all the way up to that billing part and they get a little nervous that they're gonna have to pay. But then when you finally uh, start to place the order, it'll say, oh, you don't have to pay, it's zero. Um, you hit place order and it gives you um, the link to download the materials right away. We do suggest if you're going to download frequently from our store, frequently I'd say it would be like more than two or three times, um, you might want to create a username just because it makes this process go, go through much easier. You don't have to enter your information every time. So those materials are available on the store, but we do have some materials right now that are not currently available on the store. Um, they will be available on the store soon, but because you're here, we want to give you access to them um, ahead of time if you want to take a look at them, if you're still teaching it. So we've got a lot of um, teachers who are probably still teaching for another couple weeks. Um, and so you could use these materials uh, in, the, in your classrooms um, for the remainder of the school year if you'd wanted to. That QR code at the bottom there is a new QR code. It's a different QR code that will lead you to a form to be able to get access to these new pilot deliberation materials that we have been working on. Um, these are the five topics that you'd find in uh, the link that you'll receive when you fill out that form. So we've got a comp another compulsory voting reading, but this time we've made it a bit shorter and a bit simpler um, because we know that a variety of different reading, uh, students with different reading abilities are going to be using our materials. And so we wanted to offer kind of two options there. We've got a, a reading on abolishing the electoral college um, that obviously fits really well into the theme for this, um, this webinar as well. And I'll show you uh, in the next slide in a moment, um, a little bit more about what's inside of there. And then, the last deliberation, I think, could probably fit really well into uh, this election theme. Um, the topic for that one is the United States is is the United States democracy healthy? And although it might not immediately jump out to you as being related to elections, um, it kind of puts the idea of elections and what happens in elections into a, a kind of a, a bigger context of um, elections being a part of a democratic system. Um, and so it allows us to examine how elections play a role in whether the United States democracy is healthy. And that, that deliberation actually comes with an additional lesson plan on principles of democracy to allow students to start thinking about what makes up a democracy so that they can have a more informed opinion about whether the United States democracy is healthy. So on the next slide, um, you'll see a visual that goes with our Electoral College deliberation. Um, you can see we've got a, a map from 2016 and then some, some questions that kind of ask students to read and analyze the map, but also think through the policy question of abolishing um, the Electoral College. If you abolish the Electoral College and you're, uh, let's say, a campaign strategist for a president, what might uh, your strategy look like now that there is no electoral college? So there's sort of some, um, some kind of interesting additional things that you can do with these deliberation topic packs in addition to having the conversation about whether the electoral college should be abolished. The, um, these materials that I'm talking about right now, uh, they'll, the link for them to be able to access them will stay live for maybe another month. Um, but as soon as it goes dark, uh, it will be available on our Street Law Store website. So we won't take complete access away from you ever. You just, if you ever uh, are unable to access those materials that you signed up for, just take a look at the store and you'll, uh, you'll see them. 
So that's it for me. Um, happy to answer any questions that you might have during the Q&A portion of things. And I'll also jump onto the chat if uh, now, if, if anything pops up and I'll hand it over to Kathy to do the next part of things. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna walk through um, case study methods. It looks like from our poll that a number of people are really familiar with these, um, but not everyone. So I'll sort of take it from the beginning here. Um, we have hundreds of case summaries in our free resource library that Jen was just telling you about. And um, they cover Supreme Court cases from landmark cases like uh, Marbury versus Madison, all the way up to cases that were, just, that were argued two weeks ago. But they all have something in common. They're all written in a very formulaic way, and they have at least these five factors for all of them. The facts of the case, the issues presented in the case, the precedents that were applied in the case, the arguments, and then the decision and opinion. Um, most other cases, or most cases also have another section called background that helps the students with anything they might need to know before they delve into the facts. Like, for instance, I'm going to talk about a case that is about the Electoral College. So we don't assume that everybody knows how the Electoral College functions. There'd be a background section on that. So today I'm going to spotlight a case on our SCOTUS in the Classroom uh, web page, and that is a page where we every year choose several cases that are before the court to write student-friendly um, materials for and, um, and a lot of links to other resources so that teachers can use these cases in their classrooms um, before they're argued, after they're argued, but before they're decided, and then um, if you're lucky and it gets decided before your school is out, maybe wrap it up. So the case that I'm going to talk about today to use as an example for one of our case um, study methods is Shafalo v. Washington. Although uh, Chief Justice Roberts called it Chiafalo, used, said the name Chiafalo, so you might hear it that way as well. Um, I put pictures here because I thought your students might be interested in the fact that Levi Guerrero, the woman um, circled in white, is, was 19 at the time she was an elector for the state of Washington, so not much older than most of your students. Um, Brett Shafalo, who the case is named after because his name comes alphabetically first, and Esther John. And there is the, um, the link to SCOTUS in the classroom, but it's also in the links with your other materials. So I'm going to give you a quick, and I, when I say quick, I really mean it, background of this case, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's a great sort of primer in how the Electoral College works in general as well, if that is one of your standards that you have for whatever course you're teaching. So, of course, in the summer of 2016, before the election even happened, the Democrats and the Republicans choose electors. So the state of Washington has 12 electoral votes. So the Democrats chose 12 electors. The Republicans chose 12 electors. And in the state of Washington, they say a pledge. They pledge to vote for the person who wins the popular vote in their state if their party wins. And they're informed at that time that if they break that pledge, they will get a $1,000 fine. So our electors were chosen as, our, our petitioners were chosen as three of the electors for the Democratic Party. Then of course in November, the popular vote happens and you find out who wins in the state. In the case of Washington, Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine won with 54.4% of the vote. So what that means in the way the Electoral College um, runs is that those electors go to the state capitol, in this case Olympia, Washington, and certify their ballots and mail them to Washington. At this point, it's not a secret ballot. Um, it's done in the open. And our three electors um, decided to vote for Colin Powell. And they did that because they knew that if a presidential candidate did not win 270 electoral votes, that that would throw the election to the House of Representatives. They were hoping to convince enough electors across the country, they were part of a movement to, um, to be faithless, they call this the faithless elector case, to vote for someone other than the winner in their state so that Donald Trump would be denied his 270 electoral votes and therefore um, the, president, the election would go to the House of Representatives. 
because they voted for Colin Powell and not Hillary Clinton, they were fined $1,000 each. Their votes, however, were still sent to Washington and counted in January by the president of the Senate or the vice president. Um, and because they, um, you can see from this chart, they were able to get a couple people to join them, a couple other electors. Um, there's a companion case to this. It wasn't argued together, but it was linked and argued the same day, um, Colorado v. Baca. Um, they were able to convince a couple other electors to vote for candidates other than the people who won in their state. Um, once the election was over and the um, electors were fined, they challenged that fine through in their state courts. So the case study method, we have seven case study methods. And if you look at those elements of each case summary, we consider those sort of like ingredients in a recipe. And if you mix those ingredients in different ways and sometimes leave some of them out, you can make these seven case study methods. Um, there is a link there to uh, more detailed instructions about all seven of the methods. Um, you can see the methods here, they go from the most simple at the top, the anatomy of a case, to the most complicated, a full moot court at the bottom. So we're gonna look at two in the middle, classifying arguments and as an extension, judicial opinion writing. So this is what a classifying arguments activity would look like in its sort of um, form, in its sort of handout form that you would give in a physical classroom. So in this activity, students would be presented with the background of the case, the facts, the issue, the precedents and the constitutional amendments and provisions um, that, that apply in the case. And then they would look at the arguments in a random um, order with no, um, with no labeling and decide if they think those arguments would help the petitioner, in this case, Shafalo, or the respondent, in this case, the state of Washington. And this activity really makes the students do a couple things. It makes them look into the arguments and find, um, find references to the constitutional principles and apply those find references to the precedents and apply those, um, and it makes them um, really manipulate them. So this is sort of the way that you would do it in a handout form. If you were teaching online or just like to use technology in your classroom, you might do it um, as a poll. So we're gonna do this poll together in just a moment. Ben will put the poll up. Um, so this argument was there is a difference between the power to appoint electors given to the state legislature in Article 2 and the power to control the electors' votes. The electors are given the power to vote by ballot in the 12th Amendment. So you can see there this is making the students go into Article 2, go into the 12th Amendment, which would have been supplied to them in the beginning part of the, um, of the case summary. So Ben, can you put the poll up please so we can um, participate? There we go. That's the wrong poll, Ben, sorry. Okay, well, if the poll doesn't come up, we can, um, you can write it in the chat if you'd like, if you think this helps um, Shafalo or if you think this helps the state of Washington. Thanks, Beth. Great, yeah, so this obviously helps Shafalo because the argument is, is here that um, the electors should have discretion in the way they vote, that it shouldn't be, um, that the states don't have the power to control the vote. Good. Another option for this activity that works really well, I didn't um, have Shafalo and Washington um, pictures. This is from an, uh, McDonald v. Chicago, um, but is to Print, take the arguments and print them on bigger strips of paper and have the students manipulate them and put them in columns um, in small groups probably of these arguments help one side of the case, this, these arguments help the other side. The nice thing about using the manipulables is that then they can also 
um, put them in order of what they, how compelling they find them. So they can, art, they can list them with the most compelling arguments at the top to the least compelling arguments at the bottom. And that is nice scaffolding for a couple of activities. It could be a scaffolding for a moot court or, um, or uh, judicial opinion writing. So we have many, many cases um, that you could use to teach about elections. So Baker v. Carr, Shaw v. Renos, and Citizens United v. FEC are all AP, GOPO um, required cases. They're, they're, one of, they're three of the 15 required cases. Um, but then we also have um, cases that in some cases are really good um, companion cases to those. They can be used as comparison cases. And then we have some cases that are very different, like um, Minnesota Voters Alliance v. Mansky is a really interesting case that looks at whether or not wearing political apparel to the poll violates the first, or laws against that violate the First Amendment. And then of course, um, last terms, one of last terms blockbuster cases, uh, Rucho v. Common Cause, uh, in which case, in which they decided that partisan gerrymandering is not justiciable. So how do you would make these on your own? Some of these cases already have classifying arguments created for you and you can just go to the store and search classifying arguments and you'll get a, a list of the ones that are already available. If the case that you're dying to use does not have one already created for you, it's very easy to do yourself. You, all of these case summaries are downloadable as Word documents. So you keep the beginning of it, the background, the facts, the, the issue, the amendments or constitutional provisions, laws, precedents, and you um, take the arguments that are listed by side and randomize them. Just cut and paste them in a random order. And of course, you have to delete the, um, the opinion, the decision and opinions. But those, that will allow you to create a handout just like that one that we saw for Shafalo. And it, once you've done it a couple of times, it probably takes you 10 minutes tops. As an extension of this activity, you can also have your students, once they have, once they have prioritized them with the most compelling arguments for both sides, you can have them look and decide if you were a justice, which side would you find for? So um, in the case of Shafalo, and v. Washington, they would classify those arguments and then look at them and say, okay, I think Shafalo has the strongest arguments, or I think Washington has the strongest arguments. And then you can uh, download an activity that we just recently created, um, the UB, the Justice Judicial Opinion Writing activity. The activity is actually old, the handouts are new. And it really walks the students through creating their own opinion, creating an opinion that references the constitutional provisions that applies the precedents, um, that highlights the strongest arguments from, for the side that they decide on. Um, once they've written their opinions, you can do all sorts of things. You could post those opinions and encourage students to either concur or dissent um, with other students' opinions. So I'm also gonna do a quick overview of a pretty complicated um, lesson that we have about redistricting and gerrymandering. So this is what the lesson looks like when you first go to the link and it will tell you all of the different um, outcomes. But the point of this lesson in general is for students to understand how state legislatures and governors can manipulate districts to help a party or hurt a party um, and how they can use it to gerrymander. And it focuses on the terms packing, cracking or dilution, um, compact and contiguous, which you'll see in a moment. And it allows students to take those ideas and really put them into practice immediately and then to look at what they mean in a larger sense. So in this case, they're gonna tie it back to uh, Baker v. Carr. Oops. The first part of this lesson has students looking at the vocabulary for gerrymandering. So it can be um, a little complicated. There's a background reading and it asks them to define those terms in their own words and then create a visual 
And sometimes I know uh, older students or AP students think that visuals maybe are a little beneath them, but in this case, you'll see from the activities, visuals can be really important uh, for them to be able to sketch out which, what these words uh, stand for. After they have vocabulary under their belt, it asks them to really sort of immediately put it into practice by drawing districts in order to um, create the kind of um, gerrymandering that we're talking about. So the instructions, which you don't see here, um, tells the students that there are 40 symbols in each one of these districts, um, that each of the symbols stands for 50,000 registered voters, um, that they should create four districts in each one that have 10 symbols in each district. And the idea is to let them see how it can change the number of representatives from each party based on how they draw the districts. So I took a crack at this. Um, sorry, the drawing isn't really all that great. Um, but for a non-gerrymandered district, they can create four different districts. And it doesn't really matter how many representatives come from each one or what the shapes of the districts are because they're not gerrymandered as long as those districts are using the vocabulary words that they just learned compact or not crazy shaped and contiguous and meaning no islands or you know parts that aren't attached to other ones For packing, they're going to learn in the reading that packing is the idea that you need to take the minority party and put them all in one district. So yeah, they'll win that district, but it's a, it leaves the other districts free for the majority party to win. So they'll have to draw a packed district and get as many of the moons, the minority party, into one district as possible. And then the other districts they can draw however they want. And the packed district you're going to see from below, the, the moons will win that one district, but then the other districts are very safe for the star party. I also threw in a little bit of not contiguous up there with the stars sort of like a little island, just to make sure it's gerrymandered. And then for cracking, they want to try to break the moons up so that they can't win any of the, um, any of the districts. And you can see that it's pretty easy to successfully do that. So once the students are, are able to do that, to draw their own districts, and they might need some um, support, they might need a partner, um, but at this point they're using the pictures that they drew, the definitions, the reading, um, so they have a lot of support. After that, you can sort of take the training wheels off and have them do a quiz um, where they are using kisses to manipulate um, to, to do their own districts. In this case, it's a little simplified. Um, four districts with four kisses each. And this was a teacher um, in Madison, Wisconsin, and not a student. But you can see that he is trying to crack the, uh, the four purple party kisses in order to do his districts. The last part of this lesson uh, ties the activity back to uh, the Supreme Court and back to uh, Supreme Court cases, Baker, the Supreme Court case Baker v. Carr. Um, and that's important because um, once we know that there is gerrymandering, the question is, what do we do about gerrymandering? And one of the first questions about that was, you know, can the Supreme Court even weigh in on redistricting plans? Um, is it justiciable? Is it something the court can decide? And of course, Baker v. Carr is the landmark case that decided that yes, the Supreme Court can, which gave way to um, all of the other cases that we study about gerrymandering, um, including and up to last year's um, Ruscio case, which of course said that um, partisan gerrymandering is not justiciable, but the court cannot weigh in on that. Um, so that is the overview of the gerrymandering lesson, um, and it is in detail all of the student hands out the handouts that you might need are available um, on that link. And I'm happy to take any questions about any of that as well. So uh, at the top of this webinar, Kathy mentioned that this, uh, what we'd be covering today wouldn't really go too deeply into 
uh, how to adapt these materials for at-home learning. Um, and one of the reasons why we didn't do that is because we've actually done a bit of that already. Um, so this page shares the link to uh, the work that we've done already for using street law materials for at-home learning. Um, and you'll find a bunch of things on that page when you go to it, and we're, we're still updating that page kind of as we develop new things. But you'll see um, some suggestions for how to adapt deliberation materials and deliberations themselves, the discussion, to at-home learning. You'll see some suggestions for how to adapt case summaries and uh, mock trials uh, to at-home learning, moot courts to at-home learning. Um, so there's resources there, there's the links to what you would need for the store. And then we've also done some webinars on how to uh, adapt street law materials for at-home learning. And you'll find the links to those webinars that we've uh, conducted in the past on that page. So you could find the link to um, case summaries uh, for uh, adapting case summaries for at-home learning or the link for if you're a law elective teacher, how you might uh, bring law elective resources to at-home learning. And we plan to keep this up, this page up for a, a while, especially since it's unclear what next year might look like. Um, and certainly if you have any uh, questions, if you have any requests, um, a lot of what we've created for that page has been based on teachers' interest and teachers' contact with us. Uh, so at this point, um, we want to move into Q&A and we'll give a little bit of time for people to collect their thoughts uh, for Q&A. There's a couple different options for ways that you might participate in asking questions. Um, the best option is probably to hit the Q&A button that uh, you should see on mine, it's at the bottom. Um, I don't know if you're a participant, if it's at the bottom as well. Um, but in the Q&A, you can submit a question, um, and those questions come to us. It could be a question about content. Uh, it could be a question about methods, um, and we'll be able to answer those questions kind of as they roll in. If you have a verbal question, you'd like, uh, you know, your share of the stage here, which we're happy to give up to you, um, you can hit the raise hand button and ask a verbal question. Um, and because not much is happening in the chat, if that's your preferred method for asking a question, you can ask a question um, in the chat button as well. So we'll give a few minutes for people to collect thoughts and, and see if they have any questions. Uh, right now, I don't think we have any in the queue, um, but we'll hold off until maybe something pops up. Ben, can you put up the um, the poll that we didn't get to, please? Not the one about um, Shafalo, but the the other one about um, yeah. Thank you. That one, the state standards. If you wouldn't mind taking that, um, if you're sort of thinking about questions, if you wouldn't mind taking the poll about which things are in your state standards, since I noticed in the chat that um, when we were introducing ourselves, we have people from all over the place. We'd be really curious to see um, what things that you're teaching in your classrooms. I'll also um, use this uh, break while people are, are filling out the poll to say that if you're interested in the Shafalo case, um, on our at-home um, learning page, there's also links to two webinars I did with SCOTUS blog, um, one previewing the case before it was argued and one um, debriefing the case after it was argued with Amy Howe from Howe at the Court. Um, so those are there too, if you want a, a real deep dive into Shafalo. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, it looks like everyone, um, like, looks like most everyone is doing all of them and some people, um, and definitely everyone is doing voting in some way, shape or form. 
So Jen, your compulsory voting deliberation might get a lot of views. Okay. Any any questions? Last chance for questions. We won't keep you longer if um, if there are no questions, but we wanted to leave time just in case. Okay, well we'll go on to uh, keeping in touch. But if you have questions, feel free. We'll we'll go back and check before um, before we we say goodbye. So Jen, do you want to talk about keeping in touch? Sure. Um, so. There are several different ways for you to come keep up with what street law is doing. Uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter um, are two of those options. Um, the next slide shares some uh, a little bit more about the uh, educator newsletter. Kathy, if you can sorry, I was reading questions. <laughs> sorry. Um, so if you go to streetlaw.org our educator newsletter, if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's kind of a teal bar that allows you to um, put in your email address for the educator newsletter. Make sure that you click educator newsletter. We do have some other newsletters like for legal professionals. Um, and then uh, at the last slide, I know that a couple questions came in. Um, maybe we want to answer those before we get to the last slide. Yeah, so the first question is, are the slides available? Um, we didn't put them in the link, but if you want to email us, um, happy to, to pass along the slides. Um, and the other question is, if, if there's a major legal question during the campaign, um, for example, fraudulent election claims, will you post material for that? Um, so if there are... Uh, if it gets to the Supreme Court quickly, um, we would um, we would we would look at it as a possible SCOTUS in the classroom case. Um, so we look at those when we look to teach those cases to choose those cases. We look for cases that are really student accessible. So sometimes, even though cases are really interesting, um, the the legal issues might be so involved that it's not realistic to present them to high schoolers. So a good example of that might be um, the Trump cases this year about his financial records. Um, we debated back and forth about whether to do those cases, but there were some pretty complicated legal issues uh, involved that made it not made them not super student accessible. Um, so, but certainly it would be something we would consider and if it, um, if it rose to the Supreme Court quickly and it was, um, it was something that could be written in a way that students could, um, could understand it and it wasn't too complicated legally, um, it's definitely something we would consider. Um, if, it's, if it's not a Supreme Court case, then it would be maybe a little bit more difficult to fit into our curriculum. Um, we generally don't just do sort of um, current events type lessons, but it's a possibility and we would definitely be following it and looking for ways. I'd add that, you know, that question can kind of link into the is, uh, is, democracy, is our democracy healthy deliberation. Um, there's a lot of space in asking that question about whether our democracy is healthy for students to examine current issues and bring them up uh, within conversation. Um, and so, you know, part of, of a healthy democracy should be a functioning uh, system of, of elections. Um, and so, you know, that might be a good way to frame a current issue uh, that might pop up about um, any legal questions during the campaign or during voting. Okay, so that's all the questions we have in the Q&A, so we can... So there's our email addresses and there's a, a link to the materials. I see that Lillian uh, also dropped those links into the materials as well. Um, keep an eye out to our social media and, or in your inboxes for the uh, an educator newsletter, or maybe just a, a, an email blast. Next, starting next week, we're going to roll out a teacher survey. It's very short. It won't take you more than five minutes to do. And that teacher survey is going to ask you 
um, kind of what needs you have going into next school year, whether they're content needs, whether they're about more webinars, about different strategies that you hope to use. And we wanna get a lot of particip participation in that. So we hope that um, you will fill out that uh, survey when it comes across uh, your, your screen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Great, thank you. Have a nice evening.